One Man's Family, brought to you by the makers of Chase and Sanborn Coffee and Blue Bonnet Margarine. One Man's Family is dedicated to the mothers and fathers of the younger generation and to their bewildering offspring. Today we present Chapter 2, Book 65, entitled Teddy Barber After Two Years. The wheel of fate turns slowly, but once again it's completed one full circle. Sixteen years ago, circumstances brought together the small, eager, eight-year-old orphan, Teddy Lawton, and the man, Paul Barber. For 14 years, she was Paul's daughter, until she became a graduate nurse and enlisted with the American Red Cross for European service. For two years now, she's been in the midst of this theater's post-war agonies. Two years, during which an occasional letter has barely kept the old relationship alive. And now here she is, established in Munich. And here Paul and Nicolette Moore are in Nuremberg, both in American-occupied Germany. Earlier tonight, Paul sent secretly for Teddy through the military. And just now, while he and Nicolette were shivering in their separate blankets with the thermometer steadily dropping towards zero, there came a tapping at the window. Wrapped up in this blanket. There. You think it is your daughter, Teddy? We'll soon find out. Oh, oh be no. careful, the dark. Blast the dark. I can see you have not bitten off your tongue or broken your neck. How do you get one of these German cottage windows open anyway? Here, they push out. Do you see someone outside? No, it's black in the bottom of a well. Are you making any progress? Here is the fastener. Seems to be frozen. Where? If we had a candle, I guess... Here, where my hands are. Yeah, I got it. Now, if you can turn the metal latch to the left, the window will open. If the snow hasn't melted and frozen it to the sill. There it is. You can open it. There. Oh, I thought it was cold inside. The wind off the snow. Who's outside? It's I. Weren't you expecting me? Teddy. You know me. Who, who is it? Come here. Let me hark you in the window. Don't you know Paul when you hear him? No. It isn't you, Paul. It isn't. Here. Come here. Inside with you. Oh, Paul. Paul. Oh, darling. Darling, I don't believe you. I'm afraid it's true. Oh. Your sheets feel just as warm and glowing as they used to when we came in from a walk along Seal Rocks back home. Paul. Paul. Keep your arms around me. Oh, well, you two keep warm in each other's arms. Do you mind if I close the window? There. My goodness, child. You're a sinner. You mean you can still tell through winter underwear, sweaters, vests, mufflers, and coats? And, and who's the other voice I hear in here with us? That would be Nicolette Moore. And about time. Ladies, pardon the complete darkness, which you understand is a security measure, but if you'll reach out your hands, that's it. Nicolette, I'm putting into your hand the hand of my daughter, Teddy. Teddy, this is Nicolette Moore. A most capable hand. That was exactly my first reaction, Miss Moore. A small hand, but firm and capable. I'm afraid one has to be in the position I've got myself into. Are you going to tell us all about that before we let you go? How about stumbling over and sitting on the edge of one of the beds where we can make use of our blankets? <laughs> I'm afraid Paul feels the lack of heat. <laughs> Who doesn't? Well, you two bundle up in your blankets. I'm dressed for it. Uh, so do. Sit down. Besides, one becomes uh, acclimated to a degree. Mm, I suppose you can get numb. Well, Teddy, it's been a long time. Paul, what are you doing here? How's the family? Wonderful, wonderful. Mother Barbara and Father Barbara? They're great. How about you? Oh, I'm fine. But what about Hazel and Claudia and the children? Well, here now. Let's save a little bit. Oh, Paul, I'm almost <laughs> suffocating with excitement. Oh, Paul, darling, I don't believe it. Huh? Well, just let me rub these unshaven jowls along your cheek. Oh, oh it's you, all right. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> We're in the same old whiskers in the same old place. But our Jack and Betty... Well, and... now, we've got all night long... Oh, I don't understand this. Well, some I can explain, some I can't. It's been unexplainable from the moment the military called me off duty this afternoon. I was brought to Nuremberg with all the hush-hush of a top-hole secret. I was kept undercover until half an hour ago when I was loaded into a car and driven two blocks from here. I was instructed which house to come to and, and told to enter by a dark back alley and tap on the window. Ah, uh -huh. so that was the reason for the window tapping. They didn't even tell you it was me who asked for you? Mm, nothing. Goodness knows I'm getting used to mysterious goings-on in this part of the world. What with displaced persons, black market operators, the, the occasional fragments of the old Hitler order still bobbing up, not to mention communistic activities. Well, there's always something. Well, Ben. Do you know what I thought was happening to me? No, but I'd be interested. Well, not very long ago, one of the army nurses from right here in Nuremberg completely vanished. Oh? You knew her? Well, yes, I knew her. We all knew her. 
I don't think there was anything in the papers back home. Of course not. Well, why do you say, of course not? This whole game over here is being played under the table. Nothing of importance where individuals are concerned ever gets out. When Patricia Baldwin vanished... Patricia Baldwin? That was the name of the sweet, good, darling young nurse who, who's been sacrificed to a lot of international politics. Um, Miss Lawton. What did you call me? Miss Lawton, I thought Paul said... Well, I didn't know for sure, Teddy. You told me once you were going to drop Barbara and return to your real family name. Oh, but I never did, Paul. I would have written you. Well, I wasn't sure. Of course, I haven't changed it. You're my family. I'm sorry. I was so stupid as to take anything for granted. Please, what I was going to ask you, Miss Barbara, was this. Do I catch a note of bitterness and resentment in your voice against the way matters are being conducted in Europe? Well, who wouldn't be resentful? People falling down dead on the street from hunger, legs and arms being amputated by the baskets full every day because of gangrene from freezing due to lack of fuel and clothes, hunger making children grotesque, making their fathers and mothers bloated, weak, useless. I get up in the morning furious and resentful, and I go to bed in fury and resentment. How can you help it? In the case of Patricia Baldwin, it's just more coal on your flame of anger, huh? Yes. Nobody cares. Nobody does anything about it. Well, you should have seen Patricia the day she knew she was going home. Three months, like in two years, she worked like a slavey in that hospital. And then she had an emergency appendectomy. They sent her down to us at Munich for the operation. She was on your floor in the hospital? Yes. She was a happy person. You should have seen her when they told her she was going home. And then to have some slimy international political hand reach down and grab her off the boat. Uh, that is a very interesting statement, Miss Barber. Why? Well, there are innumerable other ways a girl could vanish besides being the victim of international espionage. Don't you believe it? Not in this hotbed of world politics. But you say the girl was only a nurse in an army hospital. What on earth reason could international politicians want with her? I think she talked too much. About what? Paul, for goodness sakes, don't you understand that we're living right in the middle of things? Don't you know that a nurse in this area is liable to be taking care of some of the men with the most secret of secrets? And believe me, a man sick enough to wander in his mind will talk no matter how well he's been trained to keep his mouth shut. And do you think Patricia Baldwin took care of such a patient? I don't know. I'm just telling you how a girl like Patricia Baldwin could suddenly become dangerous to somebody. If she knew something and she let something slip... Mm -hmm, but why are we spending time talking about Patricia Baldwin? Yes, I was just beginning to wonder. When do you have to go back to Munich? How do I know? My superior was told that I would be returned when the military had finished with me. I see. We are sorry we haven't more hospitality for you. But we are required to live as others in this neighborhood live. Why? Why? Yes. You're Americans. You must be here on a mission of some kind. And there are warm barracks at headquarters. Plenty of American food and companionship. And... That's one of the questions you're not supposed to ask. What about Miss Moore here? Me? We don't talk about her either. Oh, no, we do not talk about Nicolette Moore either. Well, I never go out without a knapsack of food essentials. I even have canned heat. Ah, uh, did I not tell you she was efficient? So if you two will sit still for a minute, I'll set up my equipment and make you something hot and nourishing. Are you actually the little girl who used to crawl up into my arms when she was lonesome or hurt? I am. And I may do it again tonight. <laughs> I've been thinking about it. Paul, she may be invaluable to us in our search for Patricia Baldwin. I hope whoever kidnapped the Baldwin girl doesn't get the idea we think so. They might strike again. What's to prevent them? It's been a long time since I brought you a cup of anything, Paul. A long time, hasn't it? A long time. <laughs> It's new, it's improved, it's Chase and Sanborn, the coffee for 1948. The most satisfying coffee you ever tasted, so taste it, taste it now. There's no other way to find out how greatly Chase and Sanborn has improved. Not even your own mother can tell you. She may say it's the finest, richest, most flavorful coffee that money can buy, but even that only tells you to taste it, because this is a new coffee experience. The Chase and Sanborn your grocer has now is an inspired new combination of finer coffees, an amazing new pitch of glorious flavor is fully developed, fully realized, and fully protected until it reaches you. The vacuum pack sees to it that you get this extra flavor multiplied in the blending. Every pound of the new Chase and Sanborn is vacuum packed at its flavor peak. No other container ever made can give you so much coffee goodness. Taste it. Ask your grocer for improved Chase and Sanborn, the new nationwide coffee sensation. 
There's going to be great surprise and speculation when the barbers out of Seacliff, San Francisco, get their next letter from Teddy, and she tells them that she's seen Paul. And now let's drop down six blocks from the family home to Nicholas and Claudia's abode. Hello? Oh, uh, hello, Mom. Huh? Oh, just sitting here before the fire in Mickey's den. Almost asleep. Mickey? Oh, he's around upstairs, I think. By the way, the clock stopped. Can you see the time? 2.40. Thanks. <laughs> Anything new on Cousin Jediah? <laughs> he and Dad still feuding? Oh, a one-sided feud, huh? You honestly really think he's oblivious to Dad's feelings? <laughs> well, if he is, it's the acme of oblivion. What? No, I haven't talked with Hazel today. You are? Well, tell her Nikki and I might drop over for a little this evening. Mm-hmm. Bye, Mom. What? Oh. All right. Bye. Oh, dear. Claudia, something's eating at you on the inside. Hello, my dear. Oh, Mickey, when did you come in? Just now. Oh? You look restless, old girl. I am restless. Anything wrong? Just that I'm bored to extinction. One's bound to be in January. It gets worse in February. By March, one isn't fit for human companionship. It isn't January and it isn't February. No? No. It's me. Really? If you must know the truth, it's that old feeling coming back. Old feeling? You know what I'm talking about. I say, aren't we a bit old to fling ourselves joyously under the wheels of destiny? It's only in the young trees that the sap should rise and fall with such uncontrollable avidity. You sound like I was an old crone ready for the ash heap. My dear child, I have no desire to lecture you. But you must know that when you begin your cycle of moodiness and restlessness, you begin casting around for new pastures to feed upon, I, your husband, get cold chills up and down my spine. Nicky, darling, don't say that. Here. Sit down here on the lounge. Quite. Lie over here and put your head in my lap. <sighs> Enchantress. You smell of the spices of Araby this afternoon. I'd like to try to explain... You know the bird in the cage feeling, the animal in the trap panic. The pretty soon it'll be too late sensation. I know. I never, never thought I'd feel this way again. After I got out of Germany and you came home to me, I thought I'd had all the emotional beating I could take. And now here it is again. Yes. What about Joan, who's so proud of you, so secure in you? I know. And Penelope has never been disillusioned about anything, much less her mother. I feel awful, Nicky. And young Skip, trusted to us by Cliff, is a safe haven. It's appalling, isn't it, Nicky? My feeling this way. But what about yours truly? It would be disconsolate beyond words if I didn't have the perfume of your presence to haunt my dreams, make my waking hours complete. Don't say poetry to me, Nicky. It makes me more confused and empty. Poetry? You always say poetry when you're speaking persuasively. It's a wonder to me you haven't turned many, many girls' heads in your day. Would it make you happier if some other girl wanted me? Oh, no. Would it frighten you into forgetting your own willful desire to stray? Oh, no. You're not going to make the experiment, are you? You sound halfway as though you might like an experiment to find out. Nicky, that's wicked. I don't know. Several times lately you've said something similar. Similar? Something that inferred I might be attractive to other young women. Why to me? Why shouldn't you be to others? Why is it on your mind? Nicky, I don't know. I didn't even know it was. In fact, I don't think it is. And I think otherwise. You do? Isn't it something to do with your own restlessness? Isn't it that if you could tell yourself that I was attractive to other women, then it would justify you in making yourself attractive to other men? Well, what is it, Nicky? What is it that keeps coming back to me, unsought, out of nowhere, even when I don't want it? 
Not out of nowhere, my dear. Yes, out of nowhere. No, out of the deep places of the unconscious mind. You mean it's in me all the time? Nothing can blossom in a person which wasn't first a seed someplace deep within him. Which hasn't been cultivated and allowed to ripen and bud. Whether the bloom is a scarlet flower or a white blossom, it has to have its roots deep down in the well of our unconscious. If Mom and Dad ever suspected for one minute the kind of a daughter My they dear, had. has there ever been a man or woman, living or dead, who has not at one time or another said to himself, if ever the world for one moment suspected the true unspeakable blackness of my mind, I would be cast into the deepest dungeon forever. Mickey, you mean that in all of us... Uh, excuse me. Hello. Oh, yes, Pinky. Joan? No, she isn't in from school yet. Oh, I should imagine they'll all be home within another 10, 15 minutes. Well, look, Uncle Mickey, when Joan comes in, will you have her give me a ring? Okay, bye now. Huh? <laughs> sure. Bye. Who was that you were calling, Pinky? Oh, just called over to see if Joan was home yet. She's not. They're showing a great deal of interest in Joan lately. Isn't that okay? Well, I think so. It's nice that cousins should like each other. What's cousins got to do with it? Pinky, have you got your rubbers on? Well, I was figuring on going out. Rubbers I... come off at the door. But I just came in for a minute. Minute or I... hour, rubbers are not for indoor wear. I'm taking them off, Mom. I'll get it. Everybody home! Oh, it's Cousin Jediah. So I hear. Where do folks keep themselves around here? <laughs> right in here, Cousin Jediah. Come in and make yourself at home. Gladly, gladly. Thought I'd come over and brighten things up a little. How nice. Yep. You know the old saying, right in the corner where you are. May I take your hat? Well, that's what I'm doing this afternoon. <clears throat> Cousin Jediah? You speak to me, Pinky? May I take your hat? Gladly. Yes, sir. Polish up the old corner where you are. And how about your overcoat? So this afternoon, this is my corner. Cousin Jediah? You still talking, Pinky? <laughs> May I take your overcoat? Gladly. Won't you sit down, Cousin Jediah? And I said to myself, now there's a nice little woman... I was thinking of you, Hazel. Oh, no. I said there's a nice little woman. I'll go over this afternoon and brighten her corner, as well as my own. Is that what you were doing over at Uncle Jack's and Aunt Betty's? Polishing up their corner? Beautiful young couple. Beautiful. You didn't stay very long. I just came by there five minutes ago, and you were just going in then. Lovely family. <laughs> what was the matter? Did Aunt Betty throw you out? Why, Pinky. Sweet girl. Fine young man. Three beautiful daughters. Yeah, but what happened? Pinky, you're not being very polite. But all I want to know is why Cousin Jediah didn't brighten Aunt Betty's corner. Well, never mind now. Sweet child. Reminds me of Mrs. Fairchild. Ever tell you about Mrs. Fairchild, Hazel? Why, no, I don't think you ever did. Beautiful character. Patient. Long-suffering. Kindly. Faith. Hope. Charity. Who? Soft-spoken. <laughs> Who? Devout Democrat. Who? Pinky, stop that. Mother of five sons. Really? Five fine, big, strapping boys. Every one of them got caught in machinery. All of them what? All of them caught in machinery. I don't understand, Cousin Jediah. Nothing to explain. They were all caught in machinery. That's simple enough for anybody. <laughs> what kind of machinery? <laughs> Different kinds. Edgar got caught in a cement mixer. Yeah? Garfield got caught in the cash register. Oh, that's bad. Yep. Caught red-handed. Wallington got caught in a deep freeze. Oh, no. He was the butcher. Really? Why, sure, Mom. Wallington had to be the butcher. You know that. Susie Bell was caught in an electric ringer. Hey, wait a minute. Yes, just a minute, Cousin Jediah. You said Mrs. Fairchild had five sons. That's right. Five strapping sons. Then how come one of them was named Susie Bell and got caught in a washing machine? Ringer. Electric ringer. Okay, ringer. But who ever heard of a boy being named Susie Bell? Yep. There was a lot of customers asked that question. A lot of customers. <laughs> and then come the last boy, Tertiary. Tertiary Fairchild? But that means third. If he was the fifth son, why would they name him Tertiary? Maybe they was expecting him to come third, but he never made it. <laughs> oh, brother. He never made it. He come last. He got caught in machinery, too? Yep. <clears throat> but he was an awful disappointment to everybody. Poor little Tertiary. Yes, sir. All he ever got caught in was a mouse trap. <laughs> <laughs> Doorbell, Mom. I'll see who it is. Sweet <laughs> people. Lovely lady, Mrs. Fairchild. Yes, you've painted a vivid picture. Oh, hello, Grandfather. 
Come on in. Here, here, Pinky. Is your mother home? That's Craig. Yeah. Come on in the living room. Bless his old heart, Eddie. Yes, I've been looking forward to a visit with your mother. Heck, you old scoundrel. Huh? You here? Bless your old heart anyway. Come on over here and sit down, Father. I thought I was coming over here to escape that fellow. Fine man, Hazel. Fine man. You know something, Pinky? Yeah, what? You've got a fine man for a grandfather. <laughs> How about that, Grandfather? Are you a fine man? Yeah, I'll take care of you later. <laughs> <laughs> and that'll be enough out of you, Pinky. Okay. I guess I'll go raid the cookie jar. Did he say cookie jar? That's just what he said. Oh, wait for me, Pinky. Wait for your old cousin to die, Pinky boy. <laughs> Isn't that ridiculous? Isn't that the most preposterous exhibition you ever saw a grown man put on? You know, Father, people like that are good for us. Huh? Yes, they are. We get so stuffy and full of our own stiff-necked ideas. It's good to have a free spirit around us a little. It's free spirit, indeed. Well, he's certainly not an inhibited personality. Oof. He's always cheerful. He likes everybody. I don't know, Father. There's not enough goodwill in the world today that you can afford to sell Cousin Jediah short. He still owes me $214.83. I know it. And I think that's what's really at the bottom of your disgruntlement. Why don't you bring the subject up? Have it out with him. Oof, I've tried you don't get anywhere? He never hears anything you say to him that amounts to a hill of beans. You confront him and start to lay it on the line. He stands there, looking right through you, and begins to tell you about the Fairchild boys who were all caught in machinery. Oh, you heard that story, too? We have. <laughs> Poor little tertiary who was expected third and came in fifth. Ridiculous. I know, Father, but doesn't that sort of zany humor tickle your funny bone? Ooh. Does me. Huh? Dan says he's the funniest man since Petroleum V. Nasby. Huh? What does Daniel know of Petroleum V. Nashby? I don't know. I never heard of him. <laughs> he was a great humorist and lecturer about Mark Twain's time. He came to San Francisco when I was a very young. <laughs> Petroleum V. Nashby. I haven't thought of the fellow in years. Apparently you thought he was funny. Yes, yes. I took your mother to hear him in the old opera house. Speaking of mother, is she getting uneasy about Paul? Paul? It's been almost a month since his Christmas cablegram. Mother called up this morning, and I had a feeling Paul was very much on her mind. Yes, yes, she's been having her nervous headaches again. It could be the result of her worry. She got me to thinking about Paul, too. What do you suppose he's actually doing just now? Where is he? Teddy, are you warm enough? Well, will you keep your blankets wrapped around you. I'm all right. Can you imagine what the solid, substantial, conventional barber clan back home would think of all this business? Cold and hunger and international intrigue. Well, don't they always say that truth is stranger than fiction? As a matter of fact, Paul, since I've been over here and seen what I've had to see, I've got to believe that the Barber family way of life is the unreal and the fantastic. That's so? You hear that, Nicolette? She's gone to sleep. She's an interesting person, Paul. Uh, There's a great deal more to Nicolette Moore than shows on the surface. You're in love with her, aren't you? Why? Of course you are. The thing I want to know is, is she in love with you? It would be absurd. We're assigned to a mission. She's a fine linguist, trained in intrigue, and I happen to need a woman in the work I'm doing. Mm-hmm. That's all there is to it. Oh? Get silly notions like that out of your head. You don't think the man doth protest too much? What about your own love life? I do quite all right, thank you. Picture of a father and daughter conversation on love in a workman's cottage in American-occupied Germany. With temperature zero. Hmm. Yeah. But this is the real thing. This is reality. The way most of the people in the world are living today. The way the Barber family lives back home is fantasy. A fairy story. Hmm. It's the way much of America still lives. For how long? For the rest of my lifetime, I hope. So do I. But it can't last forever. It can't. Not with the rest of the world like this. Hmm. Let's make that our happy thought for the day. And don't tell me you're not in love with Nicolette. I've got ears to hear. Good ones.
Amos and young Pinky have been pulling books off the shelves in the library ever since dinner, but they don't seem to find what they want. I can only say this. If Shakespeare ever had tasted this new blend of Chase and Sanborn coffee, he would have written one more son. <laughs> well, that's a pretty good way to say it, Father Barber. Yeah, Uncle Nicky, but it takes too many words. What we're looking for is just a few words that tell what happens when you take that first wonderful swallow. Like getting money from home. Mm-hmm, that's okay. But we can do better. There's magic in it. Like when Cinderella's pumpkin turned into a golden coach. Well, let's see what's actually involved. When that taste sensation hits you, it's a sudden, surprising, intense upsurge of pleasure, isn't it? Yeah. Like I felt the first time Dan ever said to me, Son, you need a shave. <laughs> oh, I know. I get a much more uh, cordial feeling. More like the first time I ever called on your grandmother. I knocked at the door and stood there trembling. Oh, I say. I did. And Fanny opened the door and looked me over and said, Come in. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. The new Chase and Sanborn is your dream girl saying, Come in. <laughs> mm, too many words. Well, Nicholas, I've come to the conclusion that we'll not find our inspiration in this room nor in all the books in the world. I suggest that we take our cups to the kitchen and refill them. To refresh our memories. Yes, yes. I think the only way to tell anyone how delicious the new Chase and Sanborn is is by saying, taste it, and repeating, taste it, taste it. Aha, uh-huh, Henry's right. There's no other way. Just taste Chase and Sanborn now. The improvement is amazing, a new coffee experience. So don't miss out. Enjoy this inspired new combination of finer coffees at its best and freshest, vacuum pack. Ask for improved Chase and Sanborn, the new coffee sensation. You've just heard Chapter 2, Book 65 of One Man's Family, written and produced under the direction of Carlton E. Morse for the makers of Chase and Sanborn Coffee and Blue Bonnet Margarine. Chapter 3, entitled, Claudia is Spoiling for Trouble, will come to you next week at this same hour. Here's a word, the wise homemaker, 1948 style. Remember the letters, F-F-E, flavor, nutrition, economy. Blue bottle margarine gives all three, flavor, nutrition, economy. And what a wealth of nutrition you get in Blue Bonnet. No other spread for bread is richer in food energy, richer in vitamin A the whole year round. No wonder Blue Bonnet is so good for growing youngsters, the whole family. For here's what you get in only three half-ounce packs of country sweet Blue Bonnet. As much food energy as a medium lamb chop. As much precious vitamin A as you get in three glasses of milk. Or as much vitamin A as you get in three fresh eggs. Plus vitamin E and other food essentials. Get Blue Bonnet tomorrow. Made by the makers of Fleischmann's Yeast. This week you save up to 47 cents a pound when you buy Blue Bonnet instead of the expensive spread. And Country Sweet Blue Bonnet is rich in nutrition, rich in energy. Buy Blue Bonnet, yes sirree. Flavor, nutrition, economy. Family comes to you from California. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.